Thank you for joining us today for this webinar presented by Nelson Hardeman in collaboration with the American Addiction Treatment Association. Our topic today, which is part of a series on regulatory compliance issues relevant to addiction treatment programs, is marketing, and specifically legal and regulatory limitations on marketing addiction treatment programs. As an initial matter, please note that the information we discuss today is intended to provide a general guidance to certain as to the laws and regulations that apply to addiction treatment facilities. Although we address the issues generally, it's critical to take note of specific laws and regulations that apply in your particular state and jurisdiction that may be distinctive. The information we're discussing today is not intended to provide you legal advice, and it should not be relied upon as legal advice. Just to be clear, listening to or watching this webinar does not create an attorney-client with or their law firm. And we recommend that you seek knowledgeable legal counsel uh, that takes the law of your jurisdiction into account before acting on the information in this presentation or contact us for more information. So we just want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about in this presentation. We're going to talk about why marketing matters issue in the addiction treatment space. We're going to give you a background and talk about key enforcement players. We're going to talk about some of the key terms that you should understand. We're going to discuss prohibited practices, including kickback, self-referral, and capping and steering issues. We're going to discuss which laws apply. Uh, we're also going to discuss what marketing practices are being investigated. For example, pay for patient arrangements, call centers, bed vouchers, and sober living, urine drug testing, and um, securing insurance for patients. We're going to talk about how to avoid deceptive marketing as well. So let's begin with discussing why marketing matters. So as background, uh, prior to the Affordable Care Act, which was enacted in 2011, and the Mental Health Parity Act of 2008, uh, addiction treatment was largely a cash pay business. And that meant that while there were licensing and certification requirements uh, enforced by state regulators, it was not an area that was where, where, where claims were being submitted to insurance by and large or paid by insurance. And so as a result, it, the industry was much smaller than it is today. Anybody who's involved in the industry is aware that claim volume has grown explosively, that the number of providers have grown explosively as a result of the fact that the Affordable Care Act includes substance use disorders as part of the minimum essential coverage that health plans are required to have. And so while this growth has been wonderful from a perspective of expanding access to care for people who have addiction uh, and need treatment, uh, it is from the perspective of, a, a, of regulators, uh, it is essentially newly in the, spot, in, in the spotlight. Prior, in the time when this was a cash pay business, there simply was not uh, the level of incentive for marketing abuses and, and, and as insurance companies, health plans try to wrap their hands around this explosion in the volume and amount of insurance claims, their first response is to look to fraud risks, to look to medically unnecessary services, and so that's what the industry is experiencing right now. Um, as, a side, as a side note, there are, uh, unrelated to the whole issue of fraud and abuse, uh, in, in the submission of reimbursement claims, there are a host of patient safety issues and a lot of negative attention that has arisen around the country as a result of patients who have had been injured or have died in uh, addiction treatment facilities or overdosed after discharge from facilities. So there's a heightened level of attention from a patient safety perspective. Speaking about the state of California, we where addiction treatment facilities are now regulated by the Department of Healthcare Services, which took over for the former agency, the, De the Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, and by the California Department of Insurance, at least with respect to insurance claims. These agencies are frankly playing catch up. They were not designed and had not allocated resources for the industry in its current growth pattern and, and, and volume. Um, the California legislature is under pressure to tighten laws, and that's a phenomenon that we see nationally. We see, and we're going to talk in other programs about some of the legal changes that are coming or are on the horizon uh, for the industry. 
that need attention. So in the in the in the absence of strong state regulation um, and uh, a, a legal and laws that are really not yet necessarily uh, designed to address uh, the way that the industry has grown and that claim volume has grown, the the burden has essentially fallen to the health plans, to Anthem, Blue Shield, HealthNet, Aetna, Cigna, and United, which by the way are the currently the six large health plans uh, in California. Uh, Aetna, Anthem, and, and Cigna are now in the process of merger talks that may become the big five in the future. Uh, and if you're in, listening to this from other parts of the country, obviously you'll be talking about different health plans. But each of these health plans has what's called an SIU, a Special Investigations Unit. Special Investigations is just a euphemism for fraud and abuse investigation. Uh, and that is essentially a, the task that's fallen to these units within the health plans is to examine whether there are medically unnecessary claims or otherwise fraudulent and abusive practices, including marketing practices, and to, uh, to deal with those internally uh, by uh, disputing payment, demanding recoupment, over, uh, return of payment that's been made, and in some cases, in the most serious cases, actually building cases to be referred to criminal prosecutors. Um, and so, and the last reason why, if that's not enough for you to care about this topic, um, why it, I'm a big believer that if you look at the newspapers and you see what the public cares about, that's a good indicator about what you, as a healthcare organization, as a company in addiction treatment, should care about. And I don't have to, I don't have to tell you there is demonstrated public interest in the topic of illegality in the operation of addiction treatment program. We are in a situation where addiction is seen as a public health crisis, but the problem of abuses in uh, in, in the rendering of addiction treatment services is also seen as a problem going hand in hand. And everybody in the industry should take this seriously and should make uh, should should be thinking about how they avoid being the next uh, example of addiction treatment gone wrong. So we wanted to turn to the subject of uh, understanding the regulatory uh, players, understanding the enforcement environment and, and the government agencies that care about abusive marketing. So some of these are include the state regulators, as we mentioned before, the Department of Health Care Services and other licensing agencies that oversee operations, also the Department of Insurance, um, the health insurance companies, SIU, uh, as we mentioned before, they refer to local district attorneys for criminal prosecution, criminal prosecution in some cases, um, and large self-funded employer plans. Also, federal regulators, as well, um, are interested in enforcement. Um, the OIG, Medicare, Medi-Cal, when federal claims are involved, FBI support of state investigations including conspiracy to commit honest services mail fraud and um, also under the Travel Act. So just to say a couple words about this, you know, in general, uh, most of the reimbursement for residential drug treatment and outpatient drug treatment is that we're talking about today is privately funded, either under uh, commercial private insurance plans or under large self-funded uh, employer plans. We're not today talking about the drug, Medicaid programs, uh, and, and those that may be the subject of a future program. But just to give you a sense of how problematic the current environment is, it's worth noting uh, the way that federal regulators have stepped in. And in particular, I, we, the note about the FBI supporting state investigations is a critical one to be paying attention to. We've seen examples uh, for years of the of federal uh, enforcement stepping in to support state regulators in areas where uh, fraud and abuse does not seem to be adequately addressed uh, by, the, by state regulators. Here in California, the best recent example I can give you is in the area of the workers' comp, uh, workers' comp fraud investigations, where even though uh, the prosecutions are predominantly happening at a state level, and even though it's a state program without not federal not federally funded and not using federal dollars, federal uh, law enforcement are involved, the FBI is involved, because the issue is taken so seriously. Anytime you see congressional committees convening to talk about abuses, as we have seen in the addiction treatment space, 
that should be concerning to everyone in the industry. It, it flags that from the perception of federal and state regulators, there's a real problem here. And again, as I said on the last slide, the problem may be falling in the first instance to health insurance companies to deal with, but rest assured that the government is actively looking at this, troubled by it, and that there are going to be companies made examples of for abusive practices in the future. We wanted to talk about a few recent enforcement trends. So some of the recent enforcement trends focus on interorganizational financial relationships, also on inducements, including urine drug testing, procuring insurance, capping and steering by call centers, sober living operators and marketers, promises of free services or a waiver of responsibility to clients and family members. So it's these are we've, what we've identified here are really only kind of two overarching uh, examples of uh, possible fraud and abuse uh, practices. Uh, but interorganizational financial relationships is uh, is an is an important one. What let just to put that into plain English, the government is looking for the sin of paying for patients, right? So when one entity is recruiting patients and then essentially getting paid to drive them to a, another entity. When, a, like, let's just say, that, for example, a sober living uh, facility is, uh, is reaching out and marketing towards people with an addiction and then is bringing them to a drug treatment provider for a per patient fee, that's problematic. And so we're seeing insurance companies and government more and more interested in what the financial relationships are and looking for relationships uh, that are essentially amount to kickbacks. And we're going to talk on the next slide about exactly what a kickback is. So some of the specific examples where we see this uh, are the examples that Katie gave. Urine drug testing has really been sort of the leading edge of fraud and abuse efforts in this industry. Last year we had the Millennium case, which settled for $256 million. We had the uh, Sky Toxicology case down in Florida. And these were cases about doctors being induced to refer urine drug uh, analysis to labs, right? The Millennium case was all about doctors being induced by being given a free cup that had uh, a test in it in order to get them to refer the, uh, the, the uh, lab tests to, uh, to the labs for, uh, for confirmation testing. And in the Sky Toxicology case, we had a case where doctors were getting, I'm using air quotes if you could see me, to be getting investment returns, but the investment returns were really just transparently uh, uh, based on the volume of referrals that they were making. So urine drug testing is really the leading edge of fraud and abuse. The latest trend that we've seen in California, uh, and I know this has been a problem in Florida and other parts of the country, has been the question of procuring insurance for patients. Essentially, an accusation by the uh, insurance companies that in some cases, drug treatment providers are gaming insurance by paying for uh, paying for health insurance for patients, or in some cases, other people are are insuring the patients and then again selling them to the drug rehab. That is considered a, a kickback, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Capping and steering. Capping and steering are long ter long time terms that are used in the healthcare industry uh, for generating a patient and then referring them uh, again on a per patient basis. There's a suggestion sometimes that it involves uh, medically unnecessary claims, but frankly, it's a problem, as we'll talk about more in this presentation, it's always a problem to be getting paid per patient for the work that you do in marketing. That, that is what uh, insurance companies, what the government calls capping and steering. And then finally, the last category of promising free services. Uh, the whole issue of waiving deductibles, waiving copays is the subject of a separate webinar, which we encourage you to listen to, but in general, uh, the issue of inducement is not only a, a problem when one person generates a patient and then tries to get money out of bringing that patient to a drug treatment center, but it's also a problem if you if you essentially are inducing a patient or a patient's family to come by by giving them something for free. Uh, there has to be uh, avoidance of issues where patients are being induced by improperly. That's not to say that discounts aren't, aren't appropriate. It's a much longer conversation, and you really need to listen to our webinar uh, to get the full gist on that one. 
but that, that's the other uh, big marketing issue we're going to be talking about. And then the other topic that we wanted to bring to your attention is the increasing reliance by payers and government on data analytics, information sharing, and to identify investigation targets. So this is really a, a, a major shift. I have to tell you, I've been practicing law for uh, about 22 years now, and this has really been a radical shift over the last uh, 10 to 12 years, and it seems to be uh, accelerating. And that is that both the government and insurance companies are getting much, much better at data analytics. So just as we hear about big data and uh, computer systems getting faster and more efficient at, uh, at looking for information, that has really changed the fraud and abuse enforcement landscape. The days of insurance companies uh, or government being way behind uh, and and, and uh, coming back years later, only years later, to discover that there was some kind of improper billing are long gone. Uh, there is now they, uh, an ability with basic analytics available to the insurance companies and to the government to identify strange patterns, uh, any kind of data pattern that looks unusual. There's also a significant amount of information sharing going on between government and insurance and between uh, insurance companies to identify problematic behavior. Uh, we see much, much faster responses and things not slipping through the cracks in the way that they might have uh, in the past. Uh, we, have, we identified on the slide three different issues. One is about data pattern detection. So this is about how patients go from point A to point B. Uh, that's absolutely something uh, that we're seeing uh, that's, tra that's trackable and uh, is happening much more and more quickly. Uh, data mining and data mapping that is the insurance companies and government developing algorithms to identify problems and preventative analytics. Uh, the best way to think about this is as your credit card, right? If you if you if your credit card is stolen and is used uh, and and for some kind of purchase that's not consistent with what American Express or Visa or Mastercard expects, you almost uh, immediately these days get a, a a phone call and your card gets uh, gets turned off. Historically, that's not how the healthcare industry worked. We have the, the, me the method has been pay and chase. That is, the insurance companies pay claims, and then they uh, only later discover, whoops, uh, this claim wasn't appropriate, shouldn't have been paid, and then they ask for the money back. That's been the way that healthcare has operated, but that really is changing. And problems are, uh, unusual patterns are getting caught much more quickly. Uh, and finally, we have down here scrutiny of claims and encounter data. Uh, and we're, we're seeing that the insurance companies are looking uh, very, very closely at data. I'll give you just as one recent example. Uh, we had one of the large health plans studying uh, the data of who was, of, of what address was used for the patient uh, and looking for uh, strange patterns of patients using new addresses as a suspicious basis of um, service. Well, and we have the same level of scrutiny as going on the uh, uh, documentation at all levels. And it really, we, we, we point these things out simply to say that there were many uh, good operators who were getting away with sloppy documentation practices, and those are the people we're really speaking to. I'm not trying to create a roadmap for people who aren't doing things the right way uh, to avoid problems, but rather to help people who are trying to you know, be good providers to really understand that the, the days of sloppy documentation are over and that we're in a whole new world with respect to the ability of government and insurance companies to identify problems and stop them quickly. So now we're going to discuss some key terms to help you understand the fraud and abuse minefield. So we'll just go through them quickly. First, a kickback is giving or receiving anything of value to induce referrals of patients, goods, and services. A self-referral is referring a patient for goods or services in which the physician or family member has a financial interest. And capping and steering is paying marketers to recruit patients on a per-patient basis or based on value or volume of recruitment. Okay, good. So generally, if people are familiar with the uh, um, federal laws, we often hear about the Stark Law, which is a self-referral law. Generally, self-referral laws have focused primarily on physicians uh, or other licensed health professionals. That's why the uh, issue uh, has come up in, in the lab and urine uh, drug testing context as opposed to facilities. Kickbacks is a much broader category of law. And the important thing to note about kickbacks is that those very those beginning words, 
It's either the, it's not just the getting a, a kickback, it's also receiving, it's, it's giving or receiving. Uh, um, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're the person who tried to give something of value to get somebody to refer to you or the person who said, sure, I'll do that. You know, it, 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 both sides of the relationship are problematic. Capping and steering are more negative terms that are a narrower subset uh, um, of terms, but, and we'll explain why we included that uh, on a future slide. So we, let's talk about which laws apply. So the federal laws, again, the anti-kickback statute and the Stark laws, which prevent self-referral or prohibit self-referrals, only apply when you have federal dollars, federal health care dollars at, at stake, meaning Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, uh, or, or some other federal program. The, um, in some cases, providers are caught by surprise, and the Millennium case is a good example of that because there are some mix of, of federal claims within their overall business. Um, it's often unsafe to assume that there are no claims being submitted to Medicare if you're running a multi-site, large-volume business. Uh, but in all cases, even when federal health programs are not involved, uh, state law is going to govern. Here in California, the main anti-kickback law is Business and Professions Code, Section 650, which has a very broad definition of kickbacks. As the offer, delivery, receipt, acceptance by, by any of licensed health professional um, of consideration as compensation or inducement for referring patients. So 650 is a law that is in California based on the arrangement with a health professional. So it does apply clearly in the urine drug testing context. It does not necessarily apply if you're talking about a relationship between a uh, sober living facility, for example, and a drug treatment program between two non-physicians. Uh, we expect to see broader legislation in the future to expand the scope of anti-kickback laws in California to cover arrangements between two unlicensed people or unlicensed business entities on both sides of the table. So, but technically, Business and Professions Code Section 650 does not apply if there's no physician involved in the arrangement. Now we're going to talk a little bit about California's anti-capping and steering law. So the California Insurance Code it makes it unlawful to knowingly employ runners, cappers, steers, or other persons to procure clients or patients to perform or obtain services or benefits under a contract of insurance. So what makes someone a runner or a capper? That is employment of a person or persons to procure clients or patients to perform or obtain services or benefits that will be the basis of an insurance claim. So the reason we point out Section 1871.7 is uh, because even though the, the law that I mentioned on the previous slide of the main anti-kickback law in California doesn't necessarily apply, Section 1871.7 is a good example of a law that, uh, that will be uh, available to go after the activity of paying for patients or being paid for patients. And um, again, the, I, we made reference to it. It's, uh, the, some of the terms capping, steering, running, are not, they're not as common as kickbacks, but essentially it's getting to the same behavior, that is paying for patients. We also, we turn next to Health and Safety Code, Section 445. Uh, it's an interesting question whether this applies to drug rehab, but for purposes of this program, uh, we, we, it is worth looking at. Uh, Section 445 prohibits for-profit referrals to health-related facilities for any form of medical care or treatment. And it's interesting, we'll talk, we can talk uh, in just a minute about whether drug rehab is a form of medical care or treatment. Uh, not all programs qualify as health-related facilities. Uh, there's an interesting, in California, we currently follow a social model of treatment where facilities are not part of the health regulatory scheme, uh, and that's why they have a distinct regulation by the Department of Healthcare Services. But the, ri the risk of being covered by this law and by other laws should give providers pause about per-patient referral relationships along with capping and steering. And we can't cover, uh, can't possibly cover in this program all of the laws available to uh, law enforcement and to insurance companies uh, in pursuing uh, payment for patients. But suffice it to say that there are other; these are these laws are not the the the, the, the last word 
Um, there are other sections in the penal code and in the laws of every state that are available to insurance companies, to government, to go after behavior that is believed to be a fraudulent and, a, 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 and, and or abusive. And anytime you're paying for a patient, that is, uh, that's a problem. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what is legal in hiring marketers. The first big distinction is whether you're paying for services versus for referrals. Paying for a fair market, paying a fair market price for the time, skill, and the effort involved in what the marketer is doing and the services they're providing for you is okay. Paying per successful referral is not okay. Uh, we prefer that there be a written contract with commercially reasonable terms for a term of one year or more that's not affected by the referral value. So I, uh, just to be clear, what we're, the laws are going to be different in every state, um, but we're, I, the best uh, example that we can look to in the law, and I know that some states like Florida have really modeled on federal law, is the Medicare standards. And so this, what we've essentially done here is try to translate into plain English what, the, what a legal marketing relationship looks like. A personal services relationship where you pay a person for the time, their, for their skill or for their effort involved in marketing activity is generally going to be okay. Paying them for each successful referral is not going to be okay. And we do recommend that contracts be in writing, uh, that they be for, ideally for a term of one year or more. That's a formal requirement in the Medicare environment, uh, and it's a recommendation here, as Katie noted. Uh, that and, and with commercially reasonable terms that are not affected by the, the value or volume of claims. So that, that's what a, in general, that's what a kosher marketing relationship is going to look like. Um, and, it, and, and it requires the parties to have some trust in each other uh, and to uh, both on the side of the, uh, the paying uh, drug treatment center that the person that, that's being hired is going to put the time in and, uh, uh, and, and actually make the relationship uh, uh, pay off in the sense that the investment of time is going to lead to referrals. But there's no guarantee for, for the party who's paying. And likewise, for the party that's getting paid, uh, there's the risk that they may end up generating lots of business uh, but only being paid for the time that they spend. That's, that's, what, that's considered uh, the basis of a, of a, of a, of a, a kickback-free, that is, a legal relationship. We note here, by the way, that the, there's a big difference between W-2 employees and 1099s with respect to bonuses. First of all, as lawyers, we constantly get the question, can my marketer be a W-2, can I make this marketer a, a W-2 or a 1099? It's very important to recognize that the classification of a person as a W-2 or a 1099 is not a matter of business choice. There are very strict IRS criteria here. This is one of the most uh, widely violated laws. And what we're seeing is that uh, uh, we're seeing a, a rise in IRS enforcement and state-level enforcement of this. So the question of whether somebody's a W-2 or a 1099 is not a, a business decision. It's really about following IRS criteria and getting good advice. But if somebody is a W-2 employee, then you're paying a salary as an employer, and you have the ability, a greater ability, to pay a bonus on top of salary as a component of compensation. On the other hand, if somebody's a 1099, then you're not paying them a regular salary. They're a limited independent contractor, and it's much more problematic if they get a productivity bonus that translates into payment uh, for success, payment for the value or volume of the referrals that they make. So, uh, so marketing is an area where it, it's better to actually have W-2 employees as opposed to 1099s. So some of our clients have asked us about relationships with call centers. Treatment programs can operate their own call centers subject to avoidance of deceptive practices, but pay, paying outside call centers on a per patient basis for the value or volume of referrals is illegal. Paying for the volume of a call center or marketing services utilized at a commercially reasonable price is okay, however. So call centers are a unique phenomenon uh, of the drug rehab uh, 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 industry. We work across the uh, entire healthcare industry, and I have to say that uh, I, there's no there's no other vertical within 
the healthcare industry that seems to use call centers as much as uh, addiction treatment programs. And uh, while call, the call centers are, are, are uh, perfectly fine uh, in concept, the problem that we see is that there's a dependence upon call centers for patient flow uh, and call centers charging on a per patient basis for their referrals. Uh, uh, and, and this is not, this is simply, again, it goes back to the same basic point, paying a call center on a per patient basis is uh, not legal. It doesn't, you, you, I, I'm not going to point you to the exact statute in, in your state, but I can tell you that the insurance companies and the government agencies that review the practice are not going to, uh, they, they're, it, it just as there's no tolerance of paying per patient in other parts of healthcare, uh, it's going to be treated as a form of fraud and abuse uh, within the drug treatment industry. L paying, again, it goes back, it's just like the, the last example uh, with the mar hiring a marketer. If you pay a, 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 a regular rate, a commercially reasonable rate, uh, for call centers to uh, try and generate patients, and you pay that rate irrespective of whether there, the, there are zero referrals or ten referrals in a particular month, as long as it's a commercially reasonable rate, that's, that, could, that, that works. Uh, but, but if you are using call centers that are charging you on a per patient basis, it's probably time to reconsider. Building on that, a lot of our clients also ask us about bed vouchers. So kickbacks are not limited to payment of cash for referrals. Right, and, and the point here is that in some cases the inducement is actually uh, the kickback is an in-kind arrangement, like a uh, a, a bed and and uh, food service, essentially serving as a hotel, uh, as instead of uh, instead of getting paid cash. So, a written contract to rent a bed on a commercially reasonable terms, not affected by the referral value or volume, is a permissible type of arrangement. Right. We see, by the way, rental arrangements in all parts of the healthcare uh, spectrum. For example, hospitals will commonly rent beds from, uh, from uh, skilled nursing facilities. We will see the idea of, of taking uh, space and one healthcare facility, one provider uh, um, taking space in another facility in order to uh, situate patients there is something that happens all the time. The problem is when it's a quid pro quo meaning I'm going to send you a patient and in return you are going to pay me uh, a bed voucher or you're going to pay me an amount for housing that patient. That, that's an, that essentially means that I'm, you're, I'm asking you to induce me to refer the patient to you in exchange for uh, agree, your agreement to pay for that patient's uh, housing. And that is not, uh, that's not okay. We want, to, we want to turn now to the subject of securing insurance. This has been a hot topic in the last several months. Uh, we've, there have been many uh, insurance companies around the country investigating what we've called gaming behavior uh, with exchange-based insurance plans. And I just want to be clear here what, why, what I mean by gaming. It, prior to the Affordable Care Act, uh, in, there was a, significant, a much more limited market for individual insurance. Essentially, most of, most of the insurance plans were uh, employer-based insurance. With the uh, Affordable Care Act, you have the insurance exchanges upon which individual patients can now uh, get insurance. There are no longer pre-existing conditions as a barrier to uh, treatment. As we noted earlier at the beginning of the presentation, the minimum essential coverage must include substance use disorder uh, treatment. So as for the first time, we have the availability of insurance, and on a surface level, it appears that a patient can simply sign up for a, an insurance program on the exchange, and lo and behold, have instant coverage and a right to substance use disorder treatment. While that's wonderful from a standpoint of access to care, it's created an opportunity that is viewed as a, a form of gaming by the insurance companies. And so what we've seen is the insurance companies doing a deep dive on the data and trying to understand why they're getting all these new patients who are immediately signing up for substance use disorder treatment. And what we've noticed is that the insurance companies have focused on several data points. 
they've looked for applications for insurance or new, new insurance with an address that's inconsistent with the previously available address data. We've see, noticed insurance companies trying to link the address of the patient with an addiction treatment facility or a sober living facility, and also looking not only at address information, but also at who paid for the policy and payment by somebody unrelated to the patient who appears to lack a personal, a personal connection and, insur and an insurable interest. It's interesting to note, by the way, that in some states, there's actually a limitation in the law on who is allowed to buy insurance for another person, uh, and, and, and in, some, in other states, that is not the case. Finally, the other uh, trend that insurance companies have looked for is when an insurance policy is only paid for and maintained for as long as treatment is needed. So you can understand why the insurance companies are practices. They're, they're essentially looking at them as a form of gaming the system. Now, there's nothing wrong, by the way, with patients go, or pa patients' family members helping them uh, get insurance that's available to them. That, that was part of the whole point of the Affordable Care Act, was to take care of all of these people who didn't have insurance, the 40-something million Americans who, uh, who had no insurance in the past. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a good thing, I would argue, for people to be able to get insurance. The problem is when you are in the addiction treatment business, you can't be out there. Uh, it's, not, it's simply not okay to be signing people who come to you up for insurance. There's, in my opinion, it's perfectly appropriate to let patients know what their potential resources are, but at the point where you pay for the insurance, much like the situation where you waive patient financial responsibility for deductible or coinsurance, you're essentially inducing a patient to come to your program by, uh, by, by, by paying for that insurance. Uh, and that's, that's problematic. We point out here in particular a section of the California Penal Code which says that solicitation, section 549, solicitation, acceptance, or referral of business to or from any person or entity with knowledge or reckless disregard of their, of the, uh, uh, from their intention uh, to submit fraudulent insurance claims is, uh, is a criminal act. So it's problematic when, insurance co when, when, when people are helping <coughs> somebody else sign up for insurance uh, in, a, in a manner that's, that's, uh, that's fraudulent. And we mentioned this before, and we also have a detailed presentation in another webinar regarding this topic because it's a much bigger discussion. Uh, but a blanket waiver of patient financial responsibility, for example, the deductible or coinsurance, is interpreted by payers as a kickback or inducing the patient to select your program. You may give reasonable discounts based on a clear, consistent, reasonable standard, and uh, may, that may be legitimate. Um, for example, you can adopt a, you know, document, you can, you can document financial hardship or adopt some sort of policy having to do with determining which of your clients have uh, financial hardship. I also, I want to take this opportunity to clarify that uh, it may, we're, we're, we're not uh, suggest, trying to suggest that we agree with the, the aggressive interpretation that the health plan or in some cases government may take, uh, but we are trying to send a warning note that in general, without referring to any specific programs, we do, not, we do see the confusion and insufficient attention being paid generally to these standards. So uh, with the example on our last slide of helping patients with respect to their insurance and with the example on this slide of waiving patient financial responsibility, it's, it's, we, I can tell you from my experience, and I think Katie would agree, we, 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 we see a, a lot of good intention on the part of the industry. Uh, the problem is that when you are involved, whether it's in procuring insurance or helping patients get insurance or with regard to potential waiving a patient financial responsibility, you are in, you're in, you're in tricky waters. And it's very important to do these things in a way that are, where you're clearly on the right side of the law um, and while we're not agreeing with the insurance companies, what we're trying to highlight and what we hope has come across is that if you, if you don't, if you're not careful about how you do these things, you are setting yourself up to be uh, a target of both government and insurance companies. Another hot topic or issue that we wanted to discuss is the urine drug testing issues. Uh, in general, labs must be ordered by an MD based on medical necessity. 
Um, addiction treatment programs can establish their own licensed labs. Use of outside labs is subject to California anti-markup rules. Um, California law prohibits physicians from having a financial interest in a referral of lab services. And there's some narrow exceptions to that. Also, payments from diagnostic labs for referral of UDT are illegal. Acceptance of point of care cuffs or on-site collection services in exchange for referrals to lab are considered kickbacks. And investment arrangements with labs where the return is tied to the volume of referrals are problematic. So we talked a little bit about labs. The last two bullets here are referring to the example of what was the primary focus of the Millennium case. Uh, the uh, of investment arrangements with a return tied to the volume of referrals is really referring to the situation with Sky Toxicology uh, and that case in Florida. Uh, but what's important to note here is if you your urine drug testing has been, as I mentioned, has been the, the sort of forward leading edge of fraud and abuse enforcement, partly because insurance companies had already been objecting to uh, to urine drug testing before the Affordable Care Act as a result of a significant uptick in the utilization of urine drug testing in the workers' comp space dealing with patients with chronic pain. So as, uh, the, as the drug rehab addiction treatment industry uh, ha saw this exploding volume of claims, the insurance companies were and the government were much more ready for abuses in urine drug testing than in some of these other practices. Um, but my, uh, I would, my prediction is that just as we've seen a significant number of enforcement actions and, and, and there are a number of pending cases and investigations that, that we're aware of, uh, uh, both locally in Florida and in other markets, um, I, I think that we are going to be experiencing a significant rise in the volume of other kinds of fraud and abuse cases. And I, 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 my suggestion is that uh, anybody in this business who intends to stay in this business for the long term needs to be paying close attention to the urine drug testing example because it's, an, it, it's a great example of, of what is likely to come for the rest of the industry. And uh, there was what appeared to be a massive billing opportunity uh, uh, which, which inevitably brought abuse. That in turn brought a crackdown from the insurance companies uh, and, uh, and much tougher standards about medical necessity, about documentation, and concerns about uh, improper referrals. Now we're going to discuss avoiding false, misleading, or deceptive claims. Uh, we're going to talk about the gener general California and federal FTC prohibitions on misleading claims, um, including marketing activities and advertising must be based on the merits of the services. Um, they must be conveyed in a truthful and accurate manner. Uh, you, you, cannot, you need to disclose all material facts. Uh, claims accompanied by required qualifications, disclosures, details to substantiate claims being made. Um, and your claims need to be relevant to the service performed and capable of substantiation with objective evidence. So we're shifting gears here a little bit from some of the concerns about uh, marketing fraud related to uh, paying, inducing, and, and kickbacks, and so on. And, and now we're, we're, look, we're talking directly about marketing fraud or marketing abuses that relate to the nature of the claims being made. Um, this is an important area uh, in California in particular uh, because of there's a, this, is, this issue is taken very seriously at a state level. There's a strong consumer protection impulse, uh, and uh, it has been focused on the addiction treatment space simply because of some of the aggressive marketing practices that are out there. And as Katie noted, these are not only state level concerns, but there's a federal uh, FTC uh, concern here. So we strongly encourage addiction treatment providers to take a careful look at their marketing and to avoid claims that are uh, overly aggressive uh, and claims that, are, that may get you into trouble. Uh, we are aware of several investigations on this front, and it's also an area where we think there will be more activity in the future. So some specific marketing problems to avoid, um, false or unjustified expectations of favorable results, um, advertised price without disclosing 
clear and exact price or range of fees for specific types of services. Um, you don't want to use terms like as low as or, you know, and up to or lowest prices. Uh, paying media for publicity without disclosure. General resources advertise telephone numbers or informational resources without identification of the program name. For medical professionals, um, you don't want to use models without clear prominent disclosure. And California Business and Professions Code cause, um, cause of action for any unlawful unfair, fraudulent business or act or practice, and unfair, deceptive, untrue, or misleading advertising. It's pr that's prohibited under the California Business and Professions Code. So w one point to, that we've seen come up repeatedly is that, unfortunately, the disease of addiction is a, uh, it seems to have involved uh, frequent relapse. And, and uh, we see many programs that are, uh, that make claims that are bordering on guaranteeing uh, uh, freedom from addiction and, and uh, uh, overcoming addiction, and we, we strongly urge programs to take a careful look at their marketing from a compliance standpoint uh, and to be careful about not over-promising and uh, uh, setting up uh, consumer, uh, consumer, consumer fraud uh, cases as a result. So uh, we want to talk about the topic of marketing and the risk of uh, of, uh, of violating uh, client privacy. Uh, Katie, do you want to talk about this? Sure. Um, so this is regulated by HIPAA for programs that bill insurance and state laws in California. It's the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act. For all providers, uh, they need to protect the patient's privacy under these two laws and additional laws as well. And there's specific limitations on marketing activities related to that. Uh, you need to be aware of accidental disclosures, including photos of your clients at events or on your social media. Um, you should be careful to always get a signed written patient consent before using the patient's likeness, image, or other sort of testimonial on any of your marketing materials. And if you do use testimonials, you should note that the results may vary per client. By the way, one thing we haven't covered on this slide is Title 42 of the Code of Federal Regulations, which does provide for some heightened requirements for uh, patient uh, data privacy and security in the, uh, in the addiction treatment context. We will be covering that in a future program. So we wanted to close with some bottom line advice. Uh, the bottom line is that there are right ways and wrong ways to most market your services as an addiction treatment program and to work with marketers. Marketing the right way in a compliant manner uh, is, is leads to, gives you the opportunity to be strategic. You can focus on uh, profits and peace of mind. You can have peace of mind. On the other hand, marketing the wrong way is a, it invites the worst kind of headaches. Uh, as we've tried to, to, to cover on this program, it invites a host of legal problems. And what bothers me the most is that it leads to fear-driven reactive behavior that is also less uh, so and and frankly one of the frequent discussions that we have with operators is about all of the people approaching them with uh, with illegal marketing uh, proposals uh, and there seem to be an awful lot of marketers out there and we talked about some of the particular methods that are used uh, that uh, are out there holding holding out uh, prospective patients and wanting to get paid on a per patient basis for the value or volume of their claims. And our, our overarching advice is it's not the right way to build your business. Uh, um, it's always it's going to be a problem to work with people who don't understand how seriously uh, the government and insurance companies take compliance with marketing laws and regulations. And the, the, the way to build your business and the way to sleep at night is to ensure that you're marketing in a compliant manner. We want to thank you for listening to this webinar. We hope that it's been helpful, and we invite you to contact us with questions. Uh, we're glad to speak about this subject and look forward to being back with you in future webinars to talk about more topics on addiction treatment regulatory compliance. Thanks so much. Thank you.